Oh, you can hear me. Good afternoon. Uh, if you will uh, close that door, I'd appreciate it very much. I want to thank you all so very much for being with us today. We're all here to discuss a very important issue that is of real concern to many communities across the country, and that is the issue of homelessness. We have an outstanding panel here with us today who collectively have over 90 years of experience advocating for programs that fight injustice and inequality for the most vulnerable populations in this country and across the world. So before I begin our program, I would like to recognize some people who are here with us today. Uh, let me just mention Oren Moverman, director of Time Out of Mind, the movie that Mr. Richard Gare stars in. Would you identify yourself, Mr. Moverman? <laughs> we have Bob Roussard, president of distribution, AMC Networks, producer and distributor of the movie. Would you please identify yourself, Mr. Brissot? <laughs> we have Christine Bregan, Vice President, AMC Networks, producer and distributor of the movie, Time Out of Mind. Please identify yourself. We have some other introductions we are going to make, but at this time, is Ms. Barbara Lee still in the room? Congresswoman Barbara Lee is here. Please stand. <laughs> Congressman Cleaver is in the room. Please stand. And Congresswoman Beatty is in the room. Please stand. Thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue of homelessness in America is something that I have long been concerned about. Homelessness affects the very fabric of our communities, and it is a social issue as much as it is an economic issue. The effects of being homeless are harmful beyond what most of us can fathom, and they are often extremely difficult to reverse. Homelessness diminishes the dignity of human beings and it degrades fundamental values on which our country is built. As a nation, we've made significant progress in recent years towards the goal of ending homelessness in our country, but this progress is uneven across the country and it is at risk of stalling or backsliding without continued bipartisan support for funding federal homeless assistance and housing programs, along with the continued advocacy and service of nonprofits, government agencies, and activists on the ground. While homelessness overall has decreased in America, in my own city of Los Angeles, we have experienced a 16% increase and homelessness across the Los Angeles continuum of care from 2013 to 2015. The number of chronically homeless persons in the Los Angeles region also increased dramatically by 65% in just two years. And projections show that if we do not increase our federal, state, and local support for Los Angeles, the rate of chronic homelessness will increase by another 40% through 2017. These numbers are deeply concerning. But I remain hopeful, in large because of the commitment and resolve of homeless service providers, nonprofit organizations, advocates, and our administration, who all continue to work hard to house every single person they can with the resources they are allotted, to think creatively about how to stretch every dollar and to push to break down silos between the various levels of government. I recently visited a nonprofit organization in Los Angeles that is focused on providing chronically homeless women with permanent housing and supportive services that they need to stay housed. The women I spoke with were inspirational. One woman named Teresa opened up her home to us and spoke about the anguish and pain that being homeless caused her. She described that so many people feel that way in her situation, uh, that homelessness can be cold and it can make people feel lost and unloved and disillusioned with themselves. But Teresa was lucky enough to get an apartment through the Downtown Women's Center in 2011 
and that dramatically changed her life. We have to do more to make sure that all homeless people have the access to housing assistance, like Teresa. We have come together to educate each other about homelessness in our country. We have to have honest conversations about the challenges we face in working to end homelessness. And we have to stop making excuses for taking the steps that we already know will work. The federal government cannot turn a blind eye. Congress has a responsibility to the people of this country to provide everyone with a safe, decent, and affordable roof over their heads. And so, let's begin this dialogue with some of the top experts on this issue. First, we're very happy to have Matthew Doherty with us today. Matthew is Executive Director of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, the federal umbrella organization charged with organizing the administration's work to end homelessness. In that capacity, Matthew has spearheaded Opening Doors, the federal government's strategic plan to end homelessness. Opening Doors has brought 19 federal agencies and offices together, as well as state and local governments and communities to help make ending homelessness an attainable goal that we can all work towards. Please welcome Matthew. <clears throat> Next, we have Jennifer Ho from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, who also joins us today. Jennifer is HUD Secretary Julian Castro, Senior Advisor on Housing and Services. Jennifer helps coordinate HUD's efforts to end homelessness with other government agencies. Jen also previously worked at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, helping to craft and begin implementation of the Opening Door Strategy. Would you please welcome her? We're also very happy to have Nan Roman, President and CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness with us today. Nan has spent much of her career working on issues related to poverty and homelessness. As head of the National Alliance, Nan provides a leading voice to the challenges and issues facing America's homeless community on the local, state, and federal levels. Nan brings a world of experience, finding common sense solutions to the problems homelessness presents, partnering with government, nonprofits, and members of the community. And the last person that I'm going to introduce to you, I'm going to do it with such pride and such appreciation for who he is, and for what he stands for. We are very, very honored to have him with us today. And I don't have to say his name. I just don't want you all to scream. <laughs> we have Richard Gere with us today. You can scream if you want to. <laughs> Most of you likely know Mr. Gear from the silver screen. However, in addition to his internationally renowned acting career, Richard has worked for over 30 years to draw attention to injustice, inequality, and intolerance around the world. Through the Gear Foundation, Richard has traveled the globe to promote human rights, dignity, and justice for people everywhere. So please, again, join me with a big round of a welcome for him and all of the panel. Allow me to just mention uh, to the panel that two of the members of uh, our committee is here today focused on homelessness and inequality and disparities and all of that. Let me just make sure you know who they are. Ms. Beatty, would you please raise your hand again? Do you have another person in the back? But it was somebody in the back. Do we have someone in the back that's serving on our uh, financial services committee? Okay, so it's only been left. It's two. Okay. Is he our ranking member? Mr. Cleaver is the ranking member on the subcommittee on housing. Please stand one more time. If we have other members who are in the back, we'd like them to please come up and uh, on the front row. I thought I saw someone in the back there. 
Okay, thank you very much. Now, I would like for each of our panelists to give a brief introduction uh, before we begin our moderated discussion. We will start with Matthew and move on to Jennifer and then Nan, and then we'll have uh, Richard conclude the introduction. Great. Thank you, Congresswoman Waters. I really want to thank you for hosting this briefing today, but I especially want to thank you for being such a champion around these issues of homelessness for so long, and, and I know how important it is to you to make progress nationally and make progress in Los thank Angeles, you. and we want to be your partner in that. I'm really honored to be here with all of you today and especially to have this chance to speak with other distinguished members of Congress and the dedicated staff. Am I close enough to the microphone? Not quite. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and I'm really honored to serve at USICH and work with our federal and our national and local partners as we seek to implement Opening Doors, which Congresswoman Waters did a great job of describing. Opening Doors, I think, has fundamentally changed the conversation about homelessness in the United States, changed it from a problem that we could talk about to a problem that we can solve, and it starts with a vision that no one should experience homelessness and no one should be without a safe, stable place to call home. And as I think as every one of us could imagine, a single night of homelessness is a crisis for any individual or family, but yet we have people who have been experiencing that crisis and that trauma for years or even decades on our streets, and that's a problem we need to solve and we know how to solve. On any given night, there are, there are almost 580,000 people estimated to be experiencing homelessness as of 2014. And each of those people is a different person with different challenges. Some are challenged with disabilities. Some have experienced a health crisis. Others may have experienced a job loss or survived domestic violence. Some people are struggling with addictions or have past involvement with the criminal justice system. We need to support communities' capacity to create pathways out of homelessness for that full diversity of people who are experiencing homelessness in our country, including people who have been without homes for a day, for a year, or for 10 years or longer. And that the solutions are different for different populations, but they're fundamentally informed by the same principles of how do we quickly link people to the permanent housing with the right level of services so that they can be stable and successful members of our communities again. To get to that goal in creating those pathways out of homelessness, locally agencies and organizations are working in different ways. They're breaking down the silos across their agencies and programs, coordinating in new ways, and they're really increasingly focused on implementing the best and strongest practices. USICH's role at the federal level is to ensure that we're mirroring that breaking down of silos and we're supporting communities to be able to integrate federal resources, policies, and practices in really coordinated ways. So a big part of our work is to bring the 19 member agencies together to set common vision for the strategies that we need to implement to ensure that all the federal programs and policies are working in concert together and are helping us to achieve the goals of opening doors. We do that work in a variety of ways. We have a policy team that helps bring the members of, that, of those agencies together and builds consensus around the vision and the strategies and the solutions that all of the federal agencies need to be supporting. We really work to make sure we're identifying areas in which there may be duplication of effort or fragmentation across the federal programs and find ways that we can be more efficient with the resources that we do have. And then we also make sure that we're ensuring that those resources are being used wisely and being invested into the strongest practices that are gonna create the, the greatest outcomes. We can do a lot of that work to, to, to use existing resources more wisely. Los Angeles is doing terrific work with their federal resources and partnering with state and local resources. But it, it's not just about using the existing resources more wisely. We do need additional resources at the state, federal, and local levels. And we need investments into permanent supportive housing solutions for people experiencing chronic homelessness in our country. And the president's budget really calls for a significant investment in those resources to be able to create another 25,000 500 units of permanent supportive housing nationally to be able to help close the gap in communities that are struggling to have enough of that supply of housing. It's really critical that we bring those resources to bear, be able to deliver them to communities, have those communities use them aligned with the best practices, and we can start to turn the corner in, in even communities that are struggling to make progress today. I, uh, first, uh, Congresswoman Waters, uh, thank you so much for this hearing. Uh, Secretary Castro really appreciated being in Los Angeles with you and having an opportunity to see how homelessness manifests itself, but also meet with the nonprofits and some of the people who are being housed. You really appreciated that visit, so thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Gear. Uh, thank you for bringing your passion and your compassion to the screen and to the Congress um, to help us educate people about uh, chronic homelessness, but also some of the solutions that we have available. And thank you to people uh, who made time in the room today. I'm, I'm sure to come hear me and Matthew uh, talk. Um, uh, and, 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 oh, man, of course. We, I knew that, that you were the star. I, um, I'd ask people in the room to just take a moment and think about the problems that you're working on right now, the problems that you're trying to solve. Just make a list. 
Now, only retain on that list those problems for which you know the solution. What it's going to take, how much it's going to take, what it's going to cost, and how uh, it would be executed. That's where we are on solving and ending the problem of chronic homelessness in America. I'm guessing that there weren't a lot of other problems that leapt to mind that stayed on the list when you had to tick through the rest of the criteria. Matthew talked about 25,500 additional units of supportive housing if Congress were to invest $265 million additional dollars in HUD's homeless assistance grants. That would leverage uh, state dollars, philanthropic dollars, tax credits. Um, it would spur the creation of a sufficient supply of supportive housing, we think, to effectively end chronic homelessness in America. $265 million is the final investment that we would need to do this. And the, the thing that, that I think has become conventional wisdom is that if we don't, we're spending the money anyways, but we're spending the money to no good effect. We're spending the money on people's repeat use of jails. We're spending the money on people going to the emergency room over and over and over again or ending up in the hospital. So it really has become conventional wisdom that it costs as much for somebody to remain on the street as it does for us to provide them a supportive house, supportive housing. Um, and I guess I want to reflect, too, and, and Congresswoman Waters, you would uh, know this better than anyone, this used to be an issue that had bipartisan support year after year. Um, in the, uh, the previous administration, the Bush administration, hundreds of millions of dollars were invested year after year to create tens of thousands of additional units of supportive housing. And as a result, we has, have seen a 20% reduction in chronic homelessness across the country as a result of those investments in the creation of more supportive housing. And so at the very moment that communities are poised, that they have convinced themselves that somebody doesn't want to live on the street, uh, they want a home, that if we can engage people and connect with them and offer them the thing that they need the most, a place to live, that, that this is actually a problem that's solvable. But at that very moment, it's when we seem to have lost our traction in terms of creating the federal investments that will make the difference. So I, um, it, it's, it's, it's terrific to be here today and to have an opportunity, I guess, really to highlight the fact that in the grand scheme of everything that we do, we don't have a lot of opportunities to solve a problem. And if you take the example of the extraordinary progress that we're making on veterans homelessness, this is where we have made those consistent investments in what works. And we're seeing the results across the country. We're seeing it in places like Houston and New Orleans uh, where they have effectively ended veterans' homelessness. And we have an opportunity to do that with chronic homelessness. So I'm just thrilled to have had the opportunity to have the opportunity to be up here with you today. I really appreciate uh, the attention that we're bringing to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And thank you so much, Mrs. Waters, for, for pulling this briefing together. Uh, the National Alliance to End Homelessness is an organization that uses evidence to discover what uh, works best to end homelessness and then works with uh, works on federal to get better federal policy to support those solutions and then to help communities implement those solutions. So that's what we do. Uh, homelessness is certainly related to personal challenges that people have, like mental illness, poverty, and addiction to substances. But of course, as you know, the vast majority of people who have those kinds of problems are not homeless. They're housed. So mental illness and poverty and addiction alone are not the causes of homelessness. The fundamental cause of homelessness is that housing is just not affordable to many people who are poor. And for so many, uh, uh, and so many poor people, uh, uh, for them being able to keep themselves housed is no longer a given. And unfortunately, people who have mental and physical health issues are disproportionately poor and thus disproportionately homeless. And the reason we're talking about people who have um, uh, disabilities and mental health and, and other kinds of problems is because of the film that sort of brings us a little bit here together today, uh, Time Out of Mind, and the character that Mr. Gear uh, plays in that film. And a great thing about that, I think, for those of you uh, who haven't seen it, and I think most of us have not seen, most of you have not seen it, but hopefully you'll get the opportunity to do that, 
is that it shows really the personal experience and tragedy of, that someone faces when they become homeless. It's really, as, as I'm sure you'll discuss, very much about someone's personal experience of it. Um, it, uh, it. People that are housed, people who have housing, still have a lot of problems. I'm sure all of us, many of us have a lot of problems. But if you don't have a place to be, it's very difficult to deal with those problems, especially mental health challenges. And I think the film really shows that experience. Another thing it, it talks about, which I think is profound in the issue, is the, is the importance of connection. Uh, the main character in the film really, and so this is just my interpretation, but becomes disconnected from his family, from other people, and this contributes to his homelessness. So maybe being connected in that way doesn't really sound like a policy issue that I should be bringing up at, a, at an event like this, but many, many poor people, people who are poor have difficulty paying for their housing. Uh, Two-thirds of people who are poor pay more than half their incomes for rent, and since their rents or their uh, incomes rather are so small, that leaves such a small amount of money, really insufficient amount of money to pay for everything else that they need, uh, medicine, food, transportation, and so forth. But they network, they're connected, and they use those networks of friends, of relatives, of roommates, of associate, associates to piece things together in an often shifting way so that they can meet their needs, including housing. But if someone loses those connections, they may find themselves homeless. Uh, in reality, the actual condition of being homeless is not a very complicated thing to uh, solve, unlike the more fundamental issues that uh, uh, are associated with it may have brought it on because the fact is that housing ends homelessness. People who are housed are not homeless. And if someone who becomes homeless is lucky and get help, gets help, their homelessness will be brief and only a, a single episode. And fortunately, and contrary maybe to your understanding of the issue, that is the usual case. That is most people's experience of homelessness. But a small percentage of people, mostly people who have disabilities, have a much harder time. And they stay homeless longer, and they suffer more. In a country like ours, there really isn't any excuse to let anybody become homeless, uh, especially someone who has the kinds of problems that the character in Mr. Gere's film, George, portrays in Time Out of Mind. We may disagree about what help people do or do not deserve. But surely we can agree that in a nation such as ours, we really do not need to have widespread homelessness to prove any point. We can do better than that, and we can have a floor for people that is higher than the street, than living on the street. And a specific thing that you could do to achieve that is to support the framework that Congresswoman Waters and her colleagues uh, on a bipartisan basis, as Jennifer mentioned, have built over the years to really end homelessness among people, specifically among people who have disabilities, by creating enough permanent supportive housing, as the other speakers mentioned to you. Housing is not going to solve every problem for people, just like it doesn't solve every problem for any of us. But I can tell you that for such vulnerable people who have with disabilities, very few of the problems they have are going to get solved without it. Uh, and this is a proposal, the proposal for the permanent supportive housing uh, that's before the Appropriations Committee will help to do that. I thank you all for being here today for this discussion. Thanks to Congressman Waters for holding this briefing and for all that she has done to make to, to try to, to get a, a, us to a position where we don't have homeless people in our nation. And thanks to Richard and his team for making really a very important film that shows us about the personal journey of a man who is homeless about the human response to his experience or the lack of, of that kind of response, about the people who cross his path and about the challenges he faces. It, it's a very important film, and, and, and Oren also, the director. Having a place to live would clearly not be the solution to all of that character's challenges, but at least if he had a place to live, he wouldn't be homeless. Yeah, I'm, uh, first of all, it's a great honor for me to be here. I'm a, kind of an extraordinary honor. Um, Congresswoman Waters, I want to thank you for convening, obviously, this panel discussion. We're creating a forum for us to talk about something that's really important on, on many different levels, obvious levels and not so obvious levels about the human spirit. 
and, and who we are as human beings, what our responsibilities are to our close ones, but even those that aren't so close that maybe should be included in our family as well. Um, I'm here as a storyteller. I'm not an expert. I don't pretend to be. And we have these extraordinary experts here who have uh, uh, decades of, of uh, experience and um, expertise uh, that uh, can answer many of these problems if our legislative bodies will listen to them and how to use our collective money and resources in, a, in an effective way. Uh, I'm a storyteller. And um, movies is a form of storytelling. Uh, Orrin and I set out to make this movie. Uh, he's not only the director, he's also the writer of the script. Um, uh, the word, actually, actor in, in uh, Hindi means puppet. And uh, in some sense, I was a puppet uh, in this movie. The same way George, the character, is a bit of a puppet. Um, he seems to be rudderless. Uh, his, his driving force has been lost uh, along the way. And we meet someone who is really on his last ropes. And we see him go through the process of losing his last room in an abandoned apartment and uh, with vague references to people in his life. Um, it was a journey for, for me and for Orrin, for the rest of us who made this movie. Um, one that I felt close to, and I've been involved with this story for over 10 years, maybe 15 years, uh, and in a close involvement with the Coalition for the Homeless in New York uh, and their plight. And I'd spent time in the, in the shelters. I felt that it was something that I... Uh, I had to do, that it was important to do, um, that it, it, it was important on many levels. One, it's a problem that can be solved, but it's, but it's right there in front of us on uh, everywhere we, we turn, certainly in the city of New York, but the city of Los Angeles, any city in the United States, but in the world as well. The idea of displacement, the idea of alienation, the, the ideas of all the problems that one faces in the world. And I think we saw in, in portraying this character and me um, allowing the character to live through me this extraordinary sense of loneliness that this character felt and how that emasculated him as, as a man and as a human being and took away the tools, the drive that allows us all to function well in the world. Um, what finally happened to him is he lost his home. And what does one do when you lose your home? And as he's continually asked by everyone in the movie, do you have any friends? Do you have any family? Do you have someone who will take care of you? And he has no answer to that. There isn't anyone. We, we're introduced to a woman that we find out is his daughter. And she, there obviously has been some problems between them. And there's a huge estrangement. And he's drawn to her like a moth to a flame as an anchor, some out there far out in his imagination of how to make a, a life that's gone terribly long wrong turn well and be healed in some way. I thought I knew what was going to happen when I played this character, but I learned a lot. And I, one of the, the main things was is that in losing that home and ending up on the streets is how quickly the mind can deteriorate, how quickly what we would call mental illness starts to manifest. Um, I've been saying something that may or not be true, but I, I was swearing that I could start to see in, I have, to, I have to begin a little bit more. We ended up shooting the film with me out in the streets of New York, and the filmmaking footprint was hidden away Orrin uh, put his camera on top of buildings and apartments and storefronts and under men at work tents. So no one ever saw the camera. So when you see the film and you see New York around me, that is New York moving around me, going about their lives. They didn't know they were being filmed. And um, when we first conceived of doing this, uh, we had a certain amount of anxiety as to was this even possible? someone who was known being on the streets of New York. We thought maybe we'd get 30 seconds of good footage before someone would recognize me and we have to stop shooting. 
So we had a test day in which I, we started shooting. Astor Place in the village, uh, right in the middle of one of the busiest places in New York, but also a, a movie-going public, people who know the movies. They know Richard Gere. And the cameras were set up. I, I got uh, the nod from, from the assistant director. Two blocks away, I walked into the square, and I just stood there on the corner, right next to the famous block, the cube that spins around at Astor Place. And I was there maybe two minutes, being very, very anxious about the whole prospect, personally as me, but also as the character and the producer of the movie, of what was going to happen. And I quickly came to realize that no one was making eye contact with me, nobody. And it wasn't look like I looked that differently from myself, because I had a lousy haircut and, and bad clothes, but, but it was definitely me, albeit in character and um, not behaving like a movie star, but someone who didn't have a place to go to, someone who was still and silent on the streets of a very busy city where everyone has a place to go and a job to do and a task to perform and some place to be on time. Um, we did this shot, we were shooting digitally so we could do this, 45 minutes. I don't know how many thousands of people walked by me in that 45 minutes. Not one person recognized me. And no one made eye contact long enough to even vaguely wonder who this guy was. Now, you can imagine if I had a tuxedo and there was a red carpet <laughs> in Hastur Place, what that would be like. Um, I, the sense of isolation that I felt resonated with me with, a, with an article that was in the New York Times a few weeks ago about solitary confinement and how quickly the mind deteriorates without human contact, with that kind of dislocation. And it's exactly what I was feeling on the streets and what I think we were bringing to the movie that we all discovered as we were doing it without having those touchstones of reality, the touchstones that, that link us to a, um, a shared social experience of ourselves and the world, how quickly we lose it. And I've certainly seen that with my brothers and sisters in the shelters, the ones that friends on the street. Um, it, something else starts to happen. And once that does happen, you don't retrieve it as quickly as you lost it takes a lot of energy, psychic energy from your own side, but also energy from the community to bring you back into the fold of our consensus reality into the family of human beings. Um, certainly, shelter and the strategies that we know work, beginning with a home, are very important. But this sense of community, I think, is even more important. This sense of belonging, the sense of, of shared humanity, of care, concern, that, that we are precious to somebody is what makes us human and makes us real and makes us, gives us the energy, that driving wheel to continue to get better, to succeed. Um, so I think that's what we have to be looking for here with all the kind of uh, technocrat answers of, of how to make a life look right and function correctly. But the software of belonging, of being precious, is something that we really have to offer in the mix of things, and maybe the most important thing. Wow. Just a, a quick announcement. As you enter the facility, please take all outerwear off, belts off, all items out of your pockets, remove all hats, scarves, any unauthorized items, please get rid of them now. As soon as your stuff goes through the machine, the officer will instruct you to walk to the metal detector. Once your stuff is clear from the x-ray machine, please bring the bin back, get yourself set up, and ready for checking. Thank you.
Sir, please remember to move all items and your belt, please. Thank you. All I, I'm just looking for a place for a couple of nights because it's it's over 32 degrees outside. Look, look, yeah, that's just a little while. <laughs> that's not what I'm asking. Okay, I'm looking for your name. I want to see if you've been already assigned a shelter. Don't bust my ball. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I look. Can I just get a, a, a bed for one night? Can Do you I have do? any form of ID? No, I don't. Do you have anybody you can call? Anybody no. you can stay with a friend's couch? I don't have, I don't have any. Nothing. But are you filled up or something? Is that, I can come back later if it's, if that's better. There's no later. No. The law says we have to give you a bed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I could, any place is fine. Anything you got. I mean, the floor is fine with me. I just need a blanket. A blanket makes me sleep better. I, I like a blanket. Okay, look, you'll stay here tonight in a bed. Okay, good. We'll evaluate you. If you qualify, you'll be assigned a permanent shelter. A what? A place where you could stay. Permanent? It's up to you. We have all kinds. It's been a long time since I had a job. It's been many years. I'm, I'm too old to be hired. No one's going to hire me like that. Not like I am. I'm just, I'm, I'm really no good right now. Well, look at me, man. 9-11 blew my brains out. I had to crawl out of a ditch, if you know what I mean. I don't know what you mean. I was on your side of the glass once. Yeah, I'm just going to say something about that. That was, uh, it, that was actually in Bellevue. That was the intake. And uh, it was the first time anyone's been allowed to film. They, they believed in us so much. The city allowed us to show exactly what happens when someone goes into intake. That's the first place in New York you have to go. You have to go to Bellevue. And then they process you. The scene goes on and on. But it's, it shows you exactly what happens to someone and mirrors an event that uh, Oren and I saw when we were doing our research. You, if you see the movie, it'll come to you. But then you're processed and you, you are sent to one of the various shelters in the city after that. Wow, that was a um, very powerful clip we just saw. You made this film about a man alone, possibly with some mental or behavioral health yeah. problems navigating the streets of New York. Um, and its shelter system. I know that you've been trying to get this film made for some time. Why did you think it was important to tell this story? I don't know. Everyone asks me this, and I don't know what to say. I think uh, in, I just thought it was an important subject in, in my life. Living in New York, you were seeing homeless people all the time. I've been in New York since I was 21 years old. Some of them became friends, some of them not. Some, one day they weren't there anymore, and I wondered what happened to them. And um, I think there's a, there's a deeper level to this, and I, I, I don't think I articulated it before we made the film, but I think we're all looking for our home. And uh, I mean, we're, we, we need our physical home, but I think we're also looking for our home in a deeper sense. And um, the metaphor was powerful to me. Now, you, you, we're not gonna legislate a, a spiritual voyage looking for home. We can legislate the help of a physical home, but I think this is the root of it. Are we in this together or not? Are we all equal in looking for home? And are we gonna walk that road, however long it takes, holding each other's hands, when someone falls down, we help them stand up, and we continue walking together. So that, that was the, the feeling that that I started with when uh, I became kind of obsessed with making this. Wow. 
Let me turn to Matthew. I know the administration has set ambitious goals for ending veteran chronic family and youth homelessness. Although the data shows that the nation overall is making significant progress towards reducing and ending homelessness, when I look at my own city of Los Angeles, the numbers look much bleaker. In fact, in 2015, the Los Angeles continuum of care experienced again a 16% increase in homeless people. How are we doing towards the goals established in opening doors? Please give us a progress report and tell us, essentially, how close are we to solving the problem of homelessness? Sure. So you're exactly right. At the national level, we're making really significant progress. There are a lot of ways to look at the, the progress. One way is to start with the point-in-time count data, the number of people counted on a given night in January, how many people at that point in time are experiencing homelessness in our country. Between 2010, when Opening Doors was launched, and 2014, the most recent data that we have comprehensively, we've seen a 10% reduction in overall homelessness at the national level. We've seen a 15% reduction in family homelessness, including a 53% reduction in unsheltered family homelessness. We've seen a 21% reduction in the number of people experiencing chronic homelessness, and we're working to strengthen our estimates of the number of youth who are experiencing homelessness. We don't feel like we have the best data yet on the number of youth who are experiencing homelessness. But we've seen the greatest progress for among veterans, and that's because we've seen significant new investments into programs for veterans. The HUD-VASH program, which provides a Section 8-like subsidy, partnered with VA services for chronically homeless veterans and veterans with the most significant needs, and the Supportive Services for Veteran Families program, which can provide rapid rehousing intervention, shorter-term assistance for people with less intensive needs. We've seen significant investments into those programs, and that has driven a 33% reduction in veteran homelessness between 2010 and 2014, including a 43% reduction in homelessness among veterans. So we really are making progress, and we're seeing, as Jennifer highlighted, communities who are making even more progress and are really achieving substantial milestones both for chronic homelessness among veterans, so uh, Salt Lake City and Connecticut at the state level has effectively ended chronic homelessness among veterans, an amazing accomplishment. We've seen other cities that have effectively ended all types of veteran homelessness, New Orleans and Houston, and we have a lot of other communities who have come forward and are asking us to, to work with them to determine if they've reached that goal as well. So we're seeing really tremendous progress for veterans, and we're seeing some communities are really making tremendous progress among people experiencing chronic homelessness. The state of Utah, Houston, and New Orleans are both making extreme progress and helping people there as well. But I think there's other ways to think about the progress we're making, and some of it's harder to measure, but we're really seeing significant shifts in how communities are responding to the challenge of homelessness in their communities and the strategies that they're implementing to end homelessness. We're seeing communities focus on building what we call coordinated entry systems, a standardized way of assessing people, understanding their needs, giving them a name and an identity, and really recognizing them as individuals, which I agree is absolutely critical when we understand who they are, what their challenges are, what their goals are. We take on a higher level of responsibility for providing a solution for them. We see communities who are moving towards that kind of an approach. We've seen the recognition of permanent supportive housing as the key solution for ending chronic homelessness and wrapping around the, the, that housing opportunity with the right level of services and being able to use then that housing opportunity to re reconnect people to community, give them a sense of community and connection to one another and to the broader community. But until we get people safe and stable in housing, it's hard to start to build those connections and, and really make them full members of our communities. Um, we're seeing a much stronger embrace on housing first practices and principles, so really removing as many barriers as possible so we can get people to the right housing and the right services as quickly as possible, including a, a, a greater focus on rapid rehousing strategies for families and individuals who don't need to spend time in a long-term transitional housing program. They just need assistance to get back into housing, back into our neighborhoods, and be able to be stable and successful there. And we're seeing stronger connection between the homeless services systems and the mainstream systems of care, whose resources are really important for being able to provide that full range of services. So public housing agencies, child welfare systems, behavioral health care systems, workforce services and programs. We need all of these systems to be seeing that they have a role to play in providing the solutions that we're trying to create within our communities. And we're seeing much greater engagement and, and stronger connection. And I think fundamentally we know what it takes to end homelessness for, for people like your character in time out of mind. We know that we need to create a better system to link people to the housing quickly and deliver the services to them. And I don't know the full range of the character's challenges, but he may need permanent supportive housing and a long-term subsidy, af affordable housing that he can stay in as long as he chooses to be there with access to the services and supports that, he, that allows him to use that housing as a platform for addressing his other challenges, reconnecting with family, getting re-engaged into the workforce. And that the supportive housing model is, is proven to be able to be successful in working with people with the most significant challenges. 
Um, and there's fantastic work in ha happening in Los Angeles. I know the data is a little bit distressing there to, to see so much effort and energy being put in, so, so much of these kinds of systems being built and not yet seeing the progress. Um, and it, I think in LA, where I've done a lot of work over the years, we see some of the strongest collaborations now that have been developed between the city and the county and the private organizations, some of the strongest practitioners of permanent supportive housing. The challenge is scale. And so in communities that have been able to make the most progress, they've been able to bring their permanent supportive housing supply up to the scale to address the scale of the challenge that they face with. In LA, the scale is so large that even though there's been so much investment, we still need to take it to a higher level of scale. And that's why these investments into permanent supportive housing are so critical so that communities like Los Angeles, like New York, can continue to expand the supply of permanent supportive housing, target the people who most need that resource, bring them home into our communities, and be able to, to see the kind of progress in those cities that we've been seeing in other places as well. And knowing that it's the best use of our public resources, as Jennifer talked about, we can spend money in many different ways, but we can spend money most wisely if we create these opportunities and these successes and create savings across the rest of our emergency systems of care. Well, Matthew, I am so appreciative for your service and for the work uh, that you're doing. And your report gives me optimism. You know, as a public policymaker and a member of Congress, uh, I have been feeling pretty poorly about homelessness. And since my last visit uh, to downtown Skid Row in Los Angeles, I came away almost depressed. Yep. Uh, so. Um, I appreciate that information. It doesn't feel like that in Los Angeles. It doesn't feel like we're making progress. Richard, how does it feel in New York? How did it feel when you were making the movie? Did it? No, well, there's, I mean, no one knows. The numbers are a, a funny game to play. It's hard to know where the numbers really are anywhere. They've used the numbers of 60,000 people, give or take, 60,000 who are in beds, are given beds every night in New York City. Over 20,000 of those are kids. Those are huge numbers. And we don't know how many are actually on the streets. We're just talking about the ones who are in the shelters. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a serious problem. Uh, this, the, the mayor of New York has been taking a lot of heat on this. And it seems like it's worse. And we have a mayor who's, uh, who was elected to be uh, someone who was caring for those on the lower end of the economic scale and the underprivileged. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't appear that he has the solutions that everyone would wish that he might have. Uh, I think um, in talking to him myself, his, his, his only disclaimer was he had the money to do something. And his solution was housing. He said, but I can't find the housing. New York is not the market where I can find units. And uh, I, I'm not here to tell you he's trying hard enough okay. or has gone to the right places, yeah. gone to the correct well for that water. I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to help him myself with just some developers that I know. Uh, but he says he has the money. And we'll see if he has the will to use the money in the correct way and to twist arms and, uh, and get the job done. But it certainly doesn't feel like it's getting better. It feels like it's getting worse in New York. That's how it feels in Los Angeles. Well, let me turn to Jennifer. Uh, can you tell me a little, bit, a little bit more about homeless people who, like the lead character of this film, are chronically homeless? What do we know about chronic homelessness and how to address it, and why did the administration find it necessary to extend the goal of ending chronic homelessness by two years? Uh, thank you for uh, that question. And I've had the opportunity uh, to see the film and to think about uh, the character's experience and, and, and what's going on. I think one of the things that's very powerful about the film, as you say, Mr. Gear, you have the opportunity to see, who knows how much deterioration had happened before he hit the streets, but you really see the deterioration that happens once somebody is, is on the streets. And I think that with chronic homelessness, I think there are a few things that folks don't know. I mean, one is it's kind of the stereotype of homelessness, but as Nan was saying, it's actually not the most common experience of homelessness. Most people who become homeless, they're homeless once it's a crisis. Uh, most people self-resolve it or resolve it with a little bit of help. Um, so that picture that we have that homelessness is the person who is sleeping out on the sidewalk, the person that I walk past every day um, you know, on my way into work, 
that's actually not the most common experience of homelessness, but it certainly is the most persistent experience of homelessness. Oftentimes, it's the problems that are going on in somebody's life that uh, lead to their being on the street. Um, if somebody has, uh, has, has served and has uh, had problems in combat that have um, changed them, um, and it's hard for them to reintegrate. If somebody has a mental illness that has been uh, difficult to diagnose or where treatment has been sporadic and they haven't had good access to health care. Um, if somebody has had a problem uh, with addiction, uh, uh, oftentimes all of that is, is mixed up. Somebody said to me once, if you were homeless, you'd drink too. And it, you know, it all uh, gets mixed up. But, but I, th I think the often what we have with chronic homelessness is that we actually have a group of people who have been homeless for a long time who are aging on the street. It's not that every day there's more young people becoming chronically homeless, although we worry about that and we need good strategies on youth homelessness, we're working on that as well. But there is actually an aging group of people that are now in their 50s who have been out there for a long time. The, the things fell apart for them when we disinvested it in affordable housing, when we closed psychiatric institutions, when we criminalized um, uh, drug possession, all of those things created a group of people that has just been trapped out there. But I think that what gives me hope is that we actually know what to do. I've had the opportunity in my career to meet so many people who have been homeless 5, 10, 15, 20 years, who when they were offered a home, with no strings attached, when somebody bothered to make that connection with them and see them as a person uh, who had lost their hopes and dreams uh, and give them a safe place, a home, no strings attached, you see people not only move from homelessness to having a home, but you see them move from being hopeless to having hope, to having that, that, that opportunity to reconnect, to, to be engaged. And that's... I mean, the, the women that you met uh, with, uh, with, with my boss. I mean, that's, that's why I'm optimistic, is because so many people have had the opportunity when offered a supportive housing um, opportunity to make that enormous change in their lives. I think that's what Richard was talking about when he talked about finding a home, and he wasn't talking about the physical structures. Well, both, I Is think. that what you were? Both. Yeah, yeah, I was, but I mean, I, I know what you're saying, too, but there was a recent... Uh, uh, Articles in in the L.A. Times actually mm -hmm. about a uh, and, and in fact Matthew we were talking about this before over there um, uh, local businessmen in 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 their community local community took it upon themselves to deal with their homeless situation and they created housing they thought that would be the answer and they presented it to their homeless community that they didn't want it. And they realized that it wasn't simply buying or providing the housing. They had to spend the time of making the community, the, the human, deeply human connection. Not the, the phony one, but the one that's hard to make. You have to give time. You have to give patience. You have to be real for them to trust them enough to accept the housing that that was going to be better for them. And for what reason? Are we going to be part of this community, the society, or was this another subtle form of warehousing? We found them a way to get them off the street, but not to bring them into the community in a deep, personal, emotional, spiritual way. I'm avoiding <laughs> saying spiritual as much as I can, <laughs> but, but, but to make it as I'm really to deep as, as many possible. As I, I know. <laughs> 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 okay. No, but I think these are two two interesting issues. You don't one won't work without the other, that's, and we that's, all know that. That's, 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 all of us that's, know that. That's right. Okay, Nan. So it seems like we already know a lot about how to best address chronic homelessness, but we like the resources to really implement these solutions. We thought we did. We just learned that the mayor of New York has money and has resources. <laughs> he said, I have money. <laughs> I got money, he said. So, yeah. Oh, so um, would you agree that basically 
that it is a lack of resources rather than a lack of know-how that is holding us back from ending homelessness, particularly chronic homelessness. If the problem is money, how much do we need? Uh, would we save money in other areas if we had housing programs that ensured no one stayed homeless? Um, this um, business about we know what to do if we had the money. Uh, Richard Gere brought up an important problem, and New York is um, not a place where you have a lot of land and extra space to uh, build these units. And so what are we talking about? Uh, we have the know-how if we had the money. And what are we talking about when we say some have the money, but they don't have the land and the housing. They can't build it. So give us a little sure. discussion on that. Well, I, I think uh, there's already been some discussion. I think uh, uh, people have pointed out that we do know the solutions for most populations, and particularly for this population that we're talking about now. I think mostly people who have some kind of disabling condition and uh, who are living on the street or on shelter uh, need permanent supportive housing, and that's already been discussed. And uh, you know the cost of providing that. It's there's just there's so much evidence about the efficacy of that about. That, that people want it, that it works for them, that it saves money and health care and corrections and all different kinds of things. You know, it often strikes me about homelessness overall that the, the uh, you know, that housing, uh, just helping people a little bit with housing so that they didn't have housing instability. You know, having a home and a place to live is a very fundamental thing. It's a human need. You really can't deal with things without it. If you're getting your kitchen renovated, if you're getting your house painted, your life is turned upside down. You can't uh, do anything. And here we're expecting people who have, you know, much more serious problems than their kitchen paint peeling. Um, we expect them to deal with problems without any place to live. So housing is very fundamental. And and even though housing is expensive, housing subsidy is not that expensive. And I, I was on a housing a bipartisan policy center had a housing commission, for example, that I sat on, and it recommended giving everybody uh, who needed it, who was low income, a housing subsidy. It would save so much money in education, lack of productivity, just all over the map. Anyway, we're obviously not too close to doing that, but we estimated the cost of doing that would be about $22 billion a year. It's not cheap but I think it would save a lot of resources. But clearly there's not the political will to, to you know, address people's housing needs to scale. Uh, however, it seems like we should be able to create the political will to help people who have no place to live and are disabled to have a, a home. That does not seem to be without, beyond our ability to do. And in fact, there has been a, a quite a bit of bipartisan agreement on that and the goals around that. But I feel it's it's sort of stalled recently, and it's not so much of a priority. And I think a lot of issues for poor people are not a priority right now to, to advance. The well, policies you know, are not there. Yeah. I mean, you know, you fight yeah. the battle. You're the one in there fighting the battle here for, the, for these issues. Well, you're so absolutely correct. And uh, as you know, um, uh, we could say a lot about trying to create the National Housing Trust fund and all that as we deal with Fannie and Freddie and but we we can't get into that now I'd like to uh, kind of bring this to a close uh, because we're running out of time uh, and I'd like to just do it this way uh, the Los Angeles City Council recently had uh, a debate and came to some conclusion about what they were going to do about the homeless problem that continues to grow and grow in Los Angeles and one of the things they decided was they had to move the belongings of the homeless off the street because it was cluttering the street, it was causing uh, all kind of problems, and uh, they had to put together an effort to remove the belongings uh, that had piled up on the street. I thought that was so odd. <laughs> I thought that was so weird. It uh, yeah, it kind of misses the point uh, that you know they spent this time in the debate talking about trying to make Skid Row look better by not having the homeless with all of their belongings piled up on the street. 
And I guess, you know, in thinking about that and thinking about some of what you have said today uh, and being able to see people, individuals, be able to relate and to treat them in a fashion uh, that um, they know that they're being respected, what can we say to public policymakers and to the providers of the services about that? It's not just about, I can find you a room for tonight or a bed for tonight. How do we treat people? What can we do to help uh, those people who have the responsibility for you know, solving this problem? What can we say to them about how to, how to deal with people? I, I know you want to wrap up, so I don't know if you just wanted a, 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 quick, Everybody. Uh, a quick line. Um, you know, I think Nan said it best. The, the problem of homelessness is solved by a home, and we need more affordable housing. And, uh, you know, people can say that we don't have room or space to build housing. There's more cranes on this cityscape than any place. We're building housing. We need public policymakers that want to make sure that for every high-cost unit that goes up, there are units set aside for people uh, that need assistance, and we need investment in the types of subsidies uh, like what we would do with the $265 million if we had it in the Homeless Assistance Grants to make that housing affordable to people who, um, uh, with disabilities who are living on the street. Um, at the same time that we're saying that we need more affordable housing, not only are we not investing in the, the dollars that would make it affordable to people living on the streets, I mean, we're actually in danger of disinvesting in the home investment program, the single best engine that HUD has for the creation of more affordable housing generally. So I think it, uh, I am hopeful when I look at what's happening in communities around the country. When I despair is when I don't understand why we can have these solutions that work for people, that are better use of taxpayer dollars, that make communities more pleasant, safer places to be. If this is a problem that we can solve, why um, are we stuck on, on what's to do here? Yeah. We need more affordable housing. We need more supportive housing. That will end homelessness. Quickly, a word, Matthew, before I get to uh, Mr. Gear. I don't think there's much I can add to what Jennifer okay. just said, but I think it is fundamentally recognizing the humanity of the people who are experiencing homelessness, recognizing when you ask them what their goals are, their goals are housing, and making that the fundamental intervention that we're providing and providing the services that then allow them to use that housing as the platform for the success that they're seeking in their lives and the connection back into our communities. And the more that we recognize people as people with individual needs, goals, and dreams for themselves and make our system respond with that fundamental goal of housing for them, the stronger our, our responses are. Nan, you want to wrap it up? Too? Well, just uh, to say we do need houses for people, and I think we just need to ask them what they, yeah. if we listen respectfully to what they need, then it's going to all work out. But we have to have something to give. We have to be able to respond to that. Um, Mr. Gear, first of all, uh, again, we want to thank you so much for being here today, and um, thank you for allowing us to have a clip of the movie uh, that you have um, invested so much time and energy uh, to bring to all of us in this country. And um, I would certainly like for you to have the last word on this panel and to say whatever you'd like to say and perhaps a message to Congress if you'd like. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you, Congresswoman. You're an extraordinary person. You know, this isn't the kind of thing that people want to do. It's not easy. And the few dollars that one can get in a very difficult time to get money, this, this is not one of those projects that's very sexy right now. And it's, it's hard to see where, where one can go and be truly effective. There are, there are things that we know that work. The most effective thing that, that struck me when I started doing this in New York, in fact, we made a PSA while I was making the movie, was to keep people in the housing. If you have a problem, there is a program in New York City that if you are in danger of losing your apartment, there is a fund to help you out. It's more, it's obviously much easier to, to give that little amount of money to keep people in their homes, their apartments, whatever it may be, than to deal with them once they've lost their home and have started this rapid deterioration that I see and respond to on the streets. Um, the other feeling I get, and I spoke to the mayor about this, is that one size doesn't fit all. These, these are human beings. Everyone's got a different problem. And to think that it's one issue, whether it's you know in your mind you're thinking, which is the people on the street who saw me and did not recognize Richard Gere, 
is that from two blocks away, they saw the cliche of that mentally ill guy on the corner who probably would assault them and was gonna ask for too much money and whatever. Whatever that cliche was they had in their mind and projected that on me. This is what happens to people on the street who are vaguely in this territory of homeless, whether they're chronic or it happened yesterday or whatever it may be. It's, they're, they're painted with that brush. And I think w whatever we do, we have to realize that there is an infinite number of expressions of, of human beings being homeless. And we have to have an infinite number of solutions for them. And we can do it. We know it works. You know, you guys have done this long enough. If we gave you a personality in their situation, you would give them the strategy of how to fix it. You know how to do it. But I think we, from the legislative point of view, from the administration's point of view, we have to acknowledge that. And we, we, we want to be effective. We don't want to waste money. And the way you do that is you, you, you tailor this to the, pers to the person. To the person, not the category, but to the person. I think that's desperately important. Wow. Would you give our panel a big round of applause? Thank you so very much for being here today. And I'd like to thank all of you who took time from your schedules and the other work I know you're thinking about uh, to come and be with us today. And um, I sincerely believe that Mr. Gear's appearance here today, sharing with us his thoughts uh, and his hopes about what we can all do about homelessness will go a long way to help getting the public more involved and more focused on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd just like to um, note that the ranking member and the panelists have um, a, an engagement immediately after this. So if you guys could just hold tight while the panel can um, duck out quickly, that would be much appreciated. Thank you.